The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, episode 742 for Monday, December 31st. Happy New Year, 2018. <laughs> Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show that for over 13 years has been here taking all your questions, taking all your tips, taking all your cool stuff found, mixing in our cool stuff found, sharing everything, answering what we can with the prime directive being that we each, every one of us, me, you, him, her, all of us, learn at least five new things each and every time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include OpsGenie, now from Atlassian at OpsGenie.com, LinkedIn Jobs, where you can get 50 bucks off your first job post at LinkedIn.com slash MGG, and Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com, and we'll be talking about some of their new Thunderbolt 3 stuff, both in the sponsor spot, but also just throughout the episode, because that's kind of how this goes here at Mac Geek Cab. here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How are you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? Eh, you know, winding down. Winding down the year. Sliding into the, uh, getting ready to slide into that new year. Okay, so you're you're rounding first and sliding into the <laughs> second of 2019 for Something like perhaps that. one of the first sports analogies we've ever had on this on this show. <laughs> <laughs> So at least at least we got one in in 2018. That's good. That's good. All right. Uh, you know what? Let's just uh, let's dive right in here, John. Let's let's go to let's go to Mark here. We we started last show talking about contacts, kind of ranting about contacts, and we have uh, maybe a thought or two to share about that later in the episode. But Mark had a question about sharing contacts, and Mark pointed out. Um, he said, when I was sharing a contact from my iPhone 10 with his wife's iPhone 8, both running iOS 12. So I don't think the iPhone model numbers mattered here, but of course they might, which is why I share it. He says, I noticed the titles for child and spouse didn't transfer properly and the order was not the same. And sure enough, like things were all messed up. The, the, the titles were... Uh, reversed the names. Some of them were reversed. The titles had weird characters in them. And, uh, and I asked, I said, okay, well, what method did you use to send these? He says, I use share contact. Okay, great. And then airdropped it. Uh, and that was what he did. And I said, okay, well, you know, I've certainly done that, uh, but I haven't gone and looked on the other side. Cause usually I airdropped them to someone else and checked. Right. And, but I know that I have done it with iMessage. And so I, I said, we'll try it with iMessage. And sure enough, with iMessage came through perfectly clean. So there's some little tip here that I, some for some reason sharing, however it shares via AirDrop and however it's parsed. So it could be on one end or the other. We don't really know. But that method can result in jumbled contact records, whereas sending via iMessage tends to keep everything in its place. So uh, there you go. I'm not sure where, you know, I'm not sure where that is, but uh, figured I'd share that. Any thoughts parsing on that? Parsing error. It's, a, it's, a, it's either a parsing or a uh, parsing error on the receiving end or an encoding error, right, on the, on the sending end. Right, because embedded in the data, you would think that there are tags saying, okay, this is this field, this is that field, and it sounds like that mapping is, uh, is failing. Yeah, it almost looked like a character. It, like part of it was the the parsing, but or part of it was the 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 like the mapping, but also part of it was the just the the character types or something weren't right. Like they were, you know, like almost not HTML, but but it looked like something that was HTML encoded, where it had you know one thing standing in for another character and just some weird stuff. So that I don't know the magic up. answer. Yeah. I don't uh, that actually that actually brings up uh I don't know if this is really an issue anymore. What's that? Do you tell do you tell your iDevice what country you're in or I guess it just figures it out. 
Oh, that's interesting. No, no. Language and read. Yeah. The thing is, I've seen on multiple devices. So, so on the phone, it's in general language and region. Okay. And you tell it your language and your region. And sometimes if those are different, I've seen we- weird things happen. Both yep. on the Mac and on, uh, and on iOS. So. Huh. And I'm looking in here and long time. Listeners- how does it happen via, vo- via one vehicle, but not another leads me to believe that it's, that that's not it. But- right. Yeah. It's interesting. I'm looking in that setting in general language and region, and I'm seeing uh, preferred language order. And I added Greek here once many years ago, and it was to get some special character. We talked about it on the show and it, it, it doesn't come to me right off the top, but uh but you can you can mess with that here, right? You can you can put different keyboards and uh, different languages in here. So yeah, hmm. interesting, interesting, interesting. All right, uh, moving on to Rob. Rob writes, "I'm looking into my options for upgrading from my current October 2010 Mac Mini to a new one. The current one has a 480 gig SSD." Uh, from OWC replacing its original 320 gig hard drive. And I was wondering whether I could relocate some of my data to an external drive in order to save money on a smaller built-in SSD on the new one. As I was sorting through my home folder, evaluating my options, I noticed in my iTunes folder, something called mobile applications. This appears to contain iOS app bundles, but the last modified of any of them is May of last year. Now that iTunes no longer manages apps on iDevices, is there any point in keeping this mobile applications folder? So this is a good question, right? Um, It could be argued by some that keeping those old app binaries around is the only way to install an app that no longer exists in the app store, right? Because the binaries that you have are mapped to your Apple ID. So they can only be installed on machines that you are willing to put your password into. So mostly your devices, right? Um, So, you know, while iTunes can't manage those anymore, like iMazing can, right? So, so if, if you want to have something that might not be available from the app store in the future, fine. But the thing is, you know, if a bundle is not available in the app store, it's probably not going to be compatible for a very long time with your device, right? iOS 12 invalidated a lot of those just because of the the way things needed to work. Uh, so unless you're running something that's been discontinued or that you fear being discontinued, I think you're fine deleting them. I deleted all of mine. I used to save them like crazy. And, you know, yes, there was one time for me that it actually helped it was an old version of an app that i used for a mixer that we used to have and when the software on the mixer like the audio mixer it was for the mackie dl1608 and they changed their master fader app to match the new software but an older version of the of the mixer wasn't compatible with the new version of the software and so you had this this battle that you would fight so i kept an old version of the software around Mackie, however, after about three months, solved that by pushing two versions of the software so that you could run either one. Uh, So, you know, like, I don't know. I I don't think it's worth keeping them around. Uh, But I'm sure someone out there is waving their hands and saying, no, no, but. And that's and you're and you're probably right. But I think in a general sense, you probably can get rid of them. What do you think, John? Do you keep your app binaries around? Uh, I looked and they're there. And where are they? You may ask. Music iTunes. Oh, well, it's not even on this machine. Right. But I found it on the other one. And yeah, it had the, uh, the dot IPA, whatever. Files. Yeah. Files. Um, yeah, but I don't think it was taken up like tens of gigs. So I was like, yeah, right. Yeah. Maybe I will delete them. Right. Right. Let me see what the, yeah. 14, 14.5 gigabytes for all the stuff. And yeah, yeah. It's yeah, a like, lot of room. Yeah. But there's, um, yeah, and the date of all of them, yeah, like the, the most recent one was dated 2016. So it's like, you know, I haven't done anything with it, but it's all old stuff anyways. I'm looking, you know, like the first one is era one, you know, like a really old version. So. Yeah, right. Because it yeah. ha- cause iTunes hasn't been saving those since, yeah, for at least a year and a half. Right, right. Cool. Good question, Rob. I like it. It's uh, it's always good to think about that stuff because it's easy to just leave that, you know, as we call it, cruft. 
around, right? The stuff that's just like, oh, I don't need that, but I don't need to delete it. So it'll just stick there. Or maybe you don't even know it's there. So yeah, there you go. That's what we do here. I want to take a quick minute and talk about our first sponsor, which is Ops Genie, now from Atlassian at OpsGenie.com. You know how it is. If you listen to this show, you know that incidents are inevitable. And really what it comes down to is how you deal with them. That's what we do here every single week. We talk about how to deal with incidents. Well, the first thing is knowing that an incident happened. And this is where Ops Genie comes in because not only do you want to know, you want to make sure the right people know at exactly the right moment. And usually the right moment is as soon as possible. So this is where Ops Genie is brilliant because what happens is it, through its engine of smart notifications and timing and all of this, it empowers your de development and ops teams to plan for service disruptions and stay in control during incidents. It gives your team the power to respond quickly and efficiently to unplanned issues, and it helps to notify all the right people through a smart combination of scheduling and escalation paths. All of these things taking into account stuff like time zones, holidays, <coughs> vacation schedules, all of this good stuff. Uh, and because the folks at Atlassian know that the world doesn't live in just the ops genie bubble, they allow for deep flexibility into how, when, and where alerts are deployed, supported by over 200 integrations like Jira, Amazon CloudWatch, Datadog, New Relic, all of these things. Some of them Atlassian's products, of course, others not Atlassian's products, because again, they grok that you use tools that work for you and they want to make sure they integrate with all of those tools, no matter who makes them. They're a really smart company. They really know what they're doing there. And so Opsgenie tracks all the activity on your incidents and provides useful insights that you can look at to improve future responses. Very cool stuff. We've used it here. It saved my bacon. I, I, I like to tell the story about how we had a major problem uh, while I was asleep and I awoke to alerts that the problem happened, that the right people were notified, and that... By the time I woke up, the problem was solved. This is how it should be in real life, folks. With Ops Genie, your next incident doesn't stand a chance. So visit OpsGenie.com. And here's where it gets really good. Because you, there is where you can sign up for a free company account and add up to five team members, right? Free. No credit card required. Nothing. Free. That's OpsGenie.com. Never miss a critical alert again with Ops Genie. And our thanks to Ops Genie for doing what they do. And for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, you want to take us to Terry? Indeed. Terry writes, hi, guys. When I am in a location where there are dozens of Bluetooth devices, not mine, <clears throat> listed in iOS settings, how do I know which is which? What the heck do these numbers mean? Screenshot from Bluetooth scanning app attached. I'll tell you what they mean. So um, the screenshot, let me bring that up because that's in a separate... Uh, separate thing but it was from an app um that i found a bluetooth scanning app and basically what it shows um pally ble scanner ble being bluetooth low energy <clears throat> um all it showed was name the rssi uh, a time and date stamp and then a big long hexadecimal thing <laughs> so rssi is the signal strength right just to just Correct. to clarify that yeah sorry go ahead and then it shows this big, long hexadecimal number, which is called a UUID or Universal Unique Identifier. But it basically is like a serial number for the device. And then it should show the name, but this one only, uh, although it claims in their document or screenshots for the app that they do, when I ran it, nothing, nothing came up for the name for all, all but one. And then, you know, I would, I would tap on it and it would go drill down like one level, but it wouldn't like show you all the capabilities of the device. Um, now you may be asking, how do you do that, John? Well, you don't use this program, which um, I'm, my review would be no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, it's not a very good scanner. I, I, you know what? That's how it should be for reviews. Maybe we need to like completely revamp. We did a years ago. We revamped our review structure at Mac Observer so that it wasn't just one star through five stars or whatever. It was like, yes, you should get this. No, you shouldn't get this. And yeah, if you want to get it like, you know, we, we made it a little more realistic. Maybe it should just be yes, 
or no. That's it. It's the, the Caesar style of reviews, right? It's thumbs up and he lives, thumbs down, he dies. That's it. That's all we get. Anyway, I digress. Yeah. Um, but sports analogies and Caesar in the same episode. So, you know, I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. So the one you want to use is one that I found a while ago. Uh, and I believe these guys uh, make a development kits for Bluetooth, um, but they also make a tool and it's really good. And it's called light blue Explorer. And uh, we have a link to that in the iTunes and it's uh, cool and it's free, but, uh, and I just showed her the, the first screen. So when I run their utility, so as soon as it, it runs, it found uh, sense peanut, John's iPod touch, Apple TV, John F. Braun's iPad air, unnamed okay fair enough and wink hub too so it already identified all the devices but then with this scanner rather than just going down like one level i mean it lets you drill way way in so a lot of devices have a lot to tell you like you know for example the wink hub you know if you drill down they have a parameter uh connected to wired network yes uh last system failure and then you click on that that's how i would expect a device browser to work which is sounds like the other the other one tried or it was just it was just I don't lame. know why they show so little information thumbs down it shows everything as John uh, in our chat room said in the chat room of course at com slash stream it's a death match in the Coliseum that's what it is there you go will the app survive or not light blue Explorer thumbs up BLE scanner thumbs down that's it but it's um now, why may you want to run one of these? And I think it's just you want to know what's going on around you. Um, because normally, if you use iOS, you're only going to see devices that say, hey, I want to pair with you. Whereas this will show you anything that it can find. Right. Right. Or last yeah. I checked, that's, that's as far as iOS goes. It only shows you what it thinks you need to see. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's not always right. It's kind yeah. of the issue. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. Cool. Uh, all right. Let's go. This is a shifting gears to some network ish stuff here from Craig who writes as soon as I can find it. Come on, catch up with me. There we are. Uh, he says, um, I'm wondering how I can use certificates. So he, he wants, uh, uh, actually, I'm going to take certificates out of this because that's going to confuse things. He says, I have multiple devices in my network and I have my own domain. Um, he says, I have a Synology router, a couple of disk stations and a couple other things. He says, I have them all under my main domain. How do I get my port? Uh, how do I address them all from the same name externally? Right. And, and this is where certificates comes in because he has one certificate for like, you know, www.mydomain.com. And he wants to be able to use the same certificate on all of these devices. But he's only got one IP address for his house. So how does he connect to, you know, router.mydomain.com and, you know, disk station one at mydomain.com or disk station two.mydomain.com? How, how do you do that? And the, the answer is with one IP address, as we generally most of us have for our homes, and then obviously, you know, sharing internally with with uh, network address translation or NAT, as we call it, uh, the smartest way or the simplest way, at least to do it and the way I do it, and I think the way you do it too, John, is that you just use that one domain. So it's, you know, whatever, www.mydomain.com, whatever it is, and then you port map. So, for example... You know, for me, I have um, my Synology router on port 8500, which I think is the non-standard port. I think the standard port for that is 8000, but I had something else that needed to live on 8000. So I just moved it to 8500. And then uh, that answers there because it's the router. So I don't need to do any port mapping. My disk station, my first one, I put on port 5001 because that's the port that it wants. And I map 5001 from my external network i use port forwarding to map to 5001 on that internal ip i'm good on my second disk station this is where it gets interesting same thing you know www.mydomain.com i map port 5002 from the outside world to port 5001 on that specific device on the inside world so that everything matches up very nicely i can leave the device where it wants to be by default but from the outside world i have a different port 
and boom, everything works. And that way I'm using the same name, the same domain name for all of my devices, because really the domain name just applies to my network as a whole. And I think that's the lesson here is you, you certainly could come up with different names, but they would all point to the same IP because it's just one IP. Now, if we were to, you know, bring IPv6 into this conversation, then we could start doing some direct mappings to things because IPv6 allows for that. But uh, but generally speaking with IPv4, you're not going to get that at your home setup. So everything gets the same name and just different ports. And that's how you connect. And and then if you were doing secure certificates, you just need the one. Put the same certificate on all your devices. This is where it gets interesting, right? Generate the certificate however you're going to do it. If you have Synology devices, those do it really, really well because or the disk stations do it well because they can use a service called Let's Encrypt, which allows you to do this for free. And it renews the certificate so it doesn't expire every 90 days. And then I put a little note in my calendar to export it uh, to all my other devices every time it updates and I'm good to go. So it's all port forwards is how you deal with that. When you have multiple devices that you want to access from the outside world, that's the way to do it. So there you go. What do you think, John? Wow. That's, uh, that's creative. Wait, is that I like it? Okay. All right. Is there a better way? Um, or a different way, an alternative, not necessarily better or worse. Well, when I need to access my synologies from outside, which I think is, is what we're saying here, right? Well, I, I mean, I, I wanted to genericize it for people that have all manner of devices. Maybe you want to access a Plex server on your Mac mini from the outside, oh, sure. right? It doesn't matter. This is the way you do it. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, if, if your devices are just Synology, then I think there's a, another solution you can use, right? Oh, well, their app is, is smart. You know, I'll, uh, you know, if I need to access one of mine, I'll, uh, well, you can either, you know, they got this, uh, I think you mentioned it, Smart Connect or whatever you mm -hmm. call it. Mm -hmm. Quick Connect. Quick Connect. Quick Connect. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And they kind of do this magic for you. Yeah. Quick Connect is cool. Yeah. Because it, it doesn't. So I think they're doing, they're doing what you're doing, but they're kind of automating it a little bit, I think. Yeah. They're actually doing it a little differently. They're not just doing port forwarding. Um, mm -hmm. they're doing a, a series of, uh, of things that essentially make Nat do the port forwarding for you. And then they sort of pass that information along. They use Synology servers to handshake the connection and then pass it down the yeah. line, which is really smart. That way you don't need to worry about does my router support port forwarding or UPnP or any of that. It's like, no, nope, just let, let us do it. We've got this and it's all good. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Cool. Well, hopefully that makes sense. What do you got for us next, John? I got Steve. It's crazy. I have an annoying pop-up window that says the following. NE agent wants to use your confidential information stored in password in your keychain. I don't like to give any information out when I don't know what it is. My question is, what is any agent and should I be concerned? So just to um, be just to be clear, because it sounds different than it than it reads, it is the letter N, the letter E, and then the word agent is the process. Is that right? Not yeah. any agent, it's N E agent. Just right. just for clarity, audibly. And when I get one of these like system messages, because it's a system message, I think it yeah, it wants mm -hmm. to get to the keychain or the a password stored in the keychain. Um Here's what I did, and I was actually kind of surprised this worked, but every now and then it does. So if you get a request from something, it sounds systemy like this, or like something that is in D a lot of times. Um, fire up the terminal and bring up the man page for it. And so I typed man space NE agent, and voila, I got a manual page for it. NE agent, host process for network extension plugins. Any agent is part of the network, blah, blah, blah. And it says, oh, this may be needed if you're doing a VPN or a content filter. So. There you go. If you just started using something that changes the behavior of your network, whether it be a VPN or a content filter, um, that's why this is happening. Huh. So. I think I just saw it recently because I just, uh, I just uh, added a. Um, VPN type product. Ah, um, right. We will be discussing that in an upcoming episode. Yes. Yeah, but I think that triggered this too because it's like, well, you know, I need to, I need to know the password. 
It's like, all right. 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 <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Okay. And I think I've also noticed that um, after... You'll also see this sort of thing happen um, sometimes after a OS update. I noticed this because um, uh, Drive Pulse has a, a thing that detects added or removed um, login items or startup items. Sure. And I, I noticed that this will happen a lot of times, especially with the with the OS. I saw like three new things added. I'm like, oh, they added three new processes. That's fun. Uh-huh. So shortly thereafter, you start getting these, you know, admin queries. It's like, oh, well, that must be because they just added something new. Right, right, right. Or sometimes it'll even show you the name of what, whatever new thing they added. So that's what I got to say about that. So huh. should you be worried? Maybe. It depends on if you've, if, if you've changed anything recently. Yeah, well, I guess that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, you know, I've, been, I've been noticing as of late, and I don't know what is causing this, but um, I'm getting kind of random. Oh, this app is not optimized for the OS. You better talk to the developer. I remember getting those like after I did the major upgrade, but now it, it, it seems to be happening randomly with certain programs. I don't know if you've noticed this. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah. I'm not I, the, the the random aspect. I, I don't. I, it always seems. I, I. It always seems like I can trace it back to something. But it, it, if, even if it's just an app like auto updating itself under the hood or whatever. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that could be it. It could. Yeah. Right. I know. I run Keybase on my computer, and it it routinely I get these notifications like, oh, these items changed. It's like, yeah, okay, cool. Like, I, I guess I'll trust that. Or not, you know, I could, I could not run Keybase. I guess that's the, that's the other way to get around it. Right. Yeah. Good. More thoughts on this. I like this uh, NE agent. That's, that's, it's interesting. I, I didn't even realize that existed. Um, this network extent, like that there's network extension framework there that apps can just like tap right into and say, Oh yeah, no, no. Like I don't have to do the hard work. I, the, the Mac OS takes care of it. You know, I just do my own hard work and, and there you go. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. I get, I wonder how long that's been there. It, it's the, the man page is dated March of 2017. That seems like maybe it was brought in when the whole like Safari content filters thing was, was introduced. So I don't know. Right. I don't know. What is any agent? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm coming up with articles, and it's it's mostly brought up in the uh, in the context of a VPN. Yep. Right. Well, that it's that's 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 the interesting part, right? VPNs used to have to work really hard to to insert themselves as network devices and and make sure to capture all the network activity. And it seems like Mac OS is now just like, okay, here you go. Just let me know who you are. We'll get authentication from the user, and you're good to go. Well, that's pretty good. While we're on the uh, subject of networks and all of that, we talked in the last episode about what you might need in a router and uh, when it's time to upgrade. And listener Michael wrote in, he says, I, hey, guys, I think you left out the most important point in answering the question about when it is time to upgrade your Wi-Fi during episode 741. He says, granted, of course, it's a hard question. He says, to me... It is time to update when the router and or extender no longer gets firmware updates. Certainly after two years, it is reasonable to assume there will never be another update, maybe even a year and a half. I would actually go and say if it hasn't been updated in a year, it's certainly worth asking the question of the router manufacturer like, hey, are we end of life on on this product? Right. Um, so he says another reason be, would be when ethernet speeds through the router are slower than ethernet speeds directly connected to the modem. That's also true. That's, that's actually a really good test. Um, you know, routers have CPUs in them. So, so two separate things, right? So firmware updates, right? Great. Ethernet speeds. This is interesting because routers have CPUs in them. And, and the primary job of that CPU is to make sure the router routes, which means takes the data that's coming in from the outside world 
and passes it to the right device on the inside world. And we just kind of address this with, with some or reference this with some port mapping discussion. The router has to look at every packet and make sure it goes to the right place. That takes a CPU. If that CPU is not fast enough to handle the speeds that you are now currently getting from your ISP, that might be a good time to upgrade your router. And Michael's suggestion of using Ethernet tests, not Wi-Fi tests, but Ethernet tests to, to check this are really handy. Unplug your router entirely, restart your cable modem or whatever your, your gateway device is, plug your computer directly into that and do some speed tests, right? It has to be an Ethernet connected computer. And if you don't have uh, Ethernet on your computer, we can talk about some options in a, in a moment here. But uh, but, you know, you plug it in, do the tests, do a couple of them so that you've got, you know, kind of a mix. Then again, restart the modem, this time plugging the router back in, plug Ethernet directly into the router, see what kind of speeds you get there. Hopefully they should match. Uh, your router should be fast enough to handle whatever Ethernet speeds you get. But if it's not, that's also a good time to consider, um, you know, upgrading or swapping out or something like that. I like that. That's a good, that's good, good, good. That's good. Thoughts on that, John? Mm, nope. Okay. <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, while we're on the subject of routers, Ken has a question and he says, I hate to bug you. No, no, no. It's never a problem bugging us. It's what we do. In fact, if you want to bug us, feedback at MacGeekGab.com is the way that you do that. No. Really? Oh, yeah. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Yeah, now feedback at MacGeekGab.com, I believe, is what the esteemed Mr. Braun just said there. Mr. F. Braun to you. Uh, mm -hmm. He says, uh, but... My airport time capsule 802.11 AC that I got in 2013 is still working, but I keep getting warnings from airport utilities saying that the time capsule is overheated. That's interesting. Uh, I think that's the first I've ever heard about airport utilities saying that. He says, I have a charter modem that's Doxis 3.0, and I'm looking for a new router now, and my wife keeps hearing sounds near the router, and she fears it might cause a fire. Uh, you know, mixing those two data points together, I can't necessarily disagree with your wife. Uh, he says the house is maybe 2000 square feet and only one floor and the modem is in the middle of the house. So you have like the ideal setup. He says, so the time capsule covers the Wi-Fi. So I definitely don't need a mesh system. He says, I understand that the best is the Synology RT 2600 AC, the best router. He says, is that still the best router? And yeah, I, I would agree with that for that scenario. Um, I would, I would highly uh, lean towards the RT 2600 AC. There are other good routers out there, but the, the Synology router is, it's so powerful. It's a four by four dual band router. So it covers both 2.4 and five gigahertz with basically as much antenna and stream power as you're allowed to have, or that you can functionally have in a router here these days. So it's got that covered. Plus it's got, you know, cloud station built into it. So you can have your host, your own little Dropbox kind of thing. You can hang a USB drive off it and make it a time machine destination. So it replaces your time capsule in that way too. Um, it has its own VPN server, so you can VPN into your house. I mean, it, the, the, the list of features just goes on and on and on. So, uh, and, and the user interface is fantastic. It's a great, it, 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 as far as standalone routers go, I really haven't seen anything for the general purpose user that beats this. Um, certainly, there are some gaming routers that have some really stellar features, you know, and we've talked about those in previous episodes. But but for, you know, you're straight ahead. Here you go. Here's a router. This is uh, this is the one I would I would go with. So. So, yeah, but this is where it gets interesting. Um Synology also just came out with their new mesh router that they call the MR2200 AC. And the interesting part about this MR2200 AC is that you can certainly use it if you have an RT2600 AC, the router I just mentioned. Uh, you can certainly use the MR2200 along with it as a mesh point, right? And you can add these things, either wired or wireless, and then you can build a mesh. You don't need a mesh. That's fine. The MR2200 AC, though, it's a tri-band device. Um, it's not quite as powerful as uh, on individual bands as the RT2600 AC, but 
it's a powerful device on its own and it can be used on its own as a router. So it's not just a mesh point. It can be the router either for it only itself, or you can add other mesh points to it. So this is where it gets a little interesting for your house. I think I'd still lean towards the RT 2600 AC just to make sure you're going to get the coverage you want. You're going to spend about 200 bucks on that. The mesh, the MR 2200 is, uh, I think about 140. So you could save a little bit of money, but I think you might wind up if you had the MR, you might want a second one. And now you're not actually saving money anymore. So, so I would go with the, the RT 2600 AC. It's got more features too, but, um, but that MR 2200, it's an interesting thing. I've been running them here. The mesh works well, but it works well on its own too. It's a, it's a, just a good router. So, um, so there you go. That's, that's my, that's my thought. And really the first time we're mentioning any sort of experience with the, the MR 2200 AC here, I've, I've had one for a while um, or I've had them for a while. And, and, and initially there were some weird issues with how the mesh was being built specifically. If one device was on ethernet and another one was not um, that's like, that's a normal thing. When, whenever a new mesh product hits the market, there's the, you can, you can always, I've always been able to find an edge case with it. The real test is, you know, just like we talked about in the Atlassian ad is, is how quickly the company responds and how the company responds. And Synology has been pushing out firmware updates that have fixed all of these issues very, very quickly. You can't, you know, you, you can do your own beta testing, but once you roll something, especially like a mesh system, anything to do with Wi-Fi out, uh, you know, you just have no idea what it's going to be like. And, and no, they've been really good about it. So so I, I really like this MR2200 AC, especially as a mesh point. It can be a mesh point with your Synology, and then it all really lives together nicely. But you can also add it to other uh, routers, too, to be a mesh point. So it's very, very capable and flexible device. And it let's say you have like a, you know, a NetGate router or something. Well, as soon as you add the MR2200 AC, you not only get the meshing of it, but you also get the features of it. So you can do like you know, cloud station and that sort of thing, because you have that device now on your network, which is pretty cool. So those are, uh, those are some of my initial thoughts on that, John. And do you have any thoughts on, uh, on this, my friend? Uh, no, I'm happy with what I got, but if I, if I had to get it now, I, I'd uh, seriously consider the Synology stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because you've got, I think you you're still running Eero as your as your mesh mm -hmm. system, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't I don't need any more. I mean, I I suppose I could buy. <laughs> <laughs> There's you could always have more, right? It's just I don't, I don't need No. I'm right. content with what I have here. Yeah. One well, interesting you, thing I I found about this is uh, I've never heard of a time capsule reporting that it's overheating. Uh, That's same. weird. Uh-huh. I know. Now it could have a temperature sensor in there. Well, I'm almost certain it does. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if if that. Um, I wonder if there's like dust. I, I I. This is like the tower. It's like a tower, right? It's not. Flat. Yes. This is the, the tower time capsule. Yes. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, that, I mean, I've heard of power supplies in um, time capsules going bad. So yeah, you you. You're concerned about it burning down the house is uh, it's valid. Well, it's possible. I, I I would assume that they put a fan in there and it's possible. Well, that's what I was thinking. Fans or vents, maybe. maybe yeah. I don't know. The, whatever environment you have it in, uh, it, it may have attracted dust and dirt and, and the vents are clogged. So it's telling you, but that's, that's impressive. That tells you that. Yeah. 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 I've never seen that before. So I would, I, and and I think that and that alone, the fact that we've I mean, we've been doing this, how long have we been doing it and have never heard of uh, a time capsule reporting that I would I would heed that warning. Uh, d definitely. I, I don't think that's erroneous. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, you know what I want to do? I want to talk about our next sponsor, John, which is LinkedIn Jobs. Uh with the new year ahead, you know, it's a good time to set your goals and make sure it'll be a strong one, not just for you, but for your business too. And as I can attest, 
making the right hire is the difference between success and failure, potentially success and failure of your business as a whole. I've made the right hires over the years and uh, lived to tell the tale. I've also made absolutely the wrong hires over the, over the years and thankfully have lived to tell the tale, but, but have been through some dark times in the business making, making the wrong hiring choice. And so you can post on a job board and just hope that the right person will apply, but why leave it up to chance when you can post your job where people go every day, even if they're not looking for a job, they go to LinkedIn to make connections, grow their career and discover other opportunities. That's what LinkedIn's for. That's what I like to call LinkedIn's unfair competitive advantage, right? You're not going to these other job boards if you're not looking for a job, but you're probably going to LinkedIn pretty regularly. That's where they get you because they find you the right people that might not be looking. And oftentimes those are the best people, right? So most LinkedIn members aren't checking job boards regularly, but nine out of 10 of them are open and interested in hearing about new opportunities like yours with most of the U S workforce on LinkedIn. Posting on LinkedIn is the best way to get your job opportunity in front of more of the right people, people with the right skills, people with the right backgrounds for exactly your role who might be be ready for something new, right? This is how it works. It truly is the best way to find a person who can help grow your business. And that's why a new hire is made every eight seconds using LinkedIn. I've used LinkedIn jobs. It has truly helped us find some stellar people. And here's a deal for you. You can find the right people for your business this year at linkedin.com slash MGG and get $50 off your first job post. That's linkedin.com slash MGG to get $50 off your first job post. LinkedIn.com slash MGG. Terms and conditions apply. I have used this. You may well find your prime person before you've used up that 50 bucks. Like it, this is truly something that is valuable here. And I'm really, really stoked to be able to offer it to you. Again, it's linkedin.com slash MGG. Our thanks to LinkedIn for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, we've got some tips here. Uh, listener Paul has, well, that's kind of a fun tip. Um, he says, uh, listen to podcasts at 1.25 or 1.5 speed. He says it really powers through them and keeps you more engaged. Uh, especially if you're trying to catch up to podcasts after after the holidays. And he says you can also play YouTube at faster than normal speed to power through some of the long like hour items that still and still get the info. And he says, since I'm now used to one and a half X podcasts, it was a really easy change. I had no idea you could do this on YouTube, but it's right there. It's super easy. So um, the other tip that I'll offer, and this is more for fun than for uh, for actual productivity is Try listening to a podcast at half speed. Listen to John and me here at half speed. Uh, it'll sound like we're stoned, man. Like it's so ridiculous to hear, you know, us plodding through all this stuff. So highly recommend it just for your entertainment. Then, then you might want to nudge it back to one or, or even one and a half as, as Paul suggests. So thank you for that, Paul. Good stuff. Yeah. Good thoughts on that, John. Mm. Options. Options. Yeah, I like it. Coolio. All right. Uh, let's see. Next up, we have another tip. We actually we have several tips in a row here. Another quick tip, though. This one from Scott, who says, uh, the things I learn. If you double tap on the minutes in the iOS time picker, you can change from one minute to five minute intervals, right? Uh, or two one minute from five minute intervals. Like if you're in the calendar, you know, when you're picking times, it shows it in five minute intervals. Well, if you want to set an event that starts at 10, 13 AM, you double tap on that. And now you can set those specific times. You don't have to wait till you get back to your Mac. Like I've always done and change it there and like type it into the calendar. It's pretty good. Huh, John? There was a Reddit thread Sweet. that Scott linked it, linked us to. Yeah, so we'll put that in the show notes too. Pretty good. Any thoughts on any of this, my friend? No, they sound all, all like happy accidents. That, that's the thing. Is yes, 
<laughs> or somebody so, just getting curious. Oh, I wonder what happens if I tap on that. Oh. So, so now we've referenced the sport analogy. We've referenced Caesar and, and with you, uh, citing happy little accidents, we've now also referenced Bob Ross. So uh -huh. I, I, this is fantastic. This is perhaps my favorite episode ever. And we're not even finished. Uh, yeah. Okay. Moving on. Phil has a correction clarification to offer. He says in, uh, in, I think it was Mac geek up seven forty. uh, you guys were discussing ports and devices. He says, Dave commented that one of the devices was USB 3.0, not 3.1 USB 3.0 as Paul, or Phil, sorry, Phil correctly states is no more and has been absorbed into the USB 3.1 spec as USB 3.1 Gen 1. So that's, yes, you are absolutely correct. And uh, he links us to a Tom's Hardware article that sort of pedantically, like, well, in a well thought out way, walks through why this is and how this is and all of that stuff. So, yeah, great. So much fun. USB. Why? Why USB? Do we have letters and numbers and numbers that mean the same thing, but sound different and all of that stuff? It's crazy. It's crazy, John. Any thoughts on all that? One's faster than the other, I think, because it's pretty much it. <laughs> no, no. <coughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. No, that's what I got from the article. I guess that's true. Yes. Oh, no, you're, you're right. Yeah, one is just faster than the other. Yeah. Yeah. God. Why they do this to us, though? Like, I just don't get it. I don't like it. Well, I don't know about renaming standards that I find confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and you're right. One is faster. Gen one, or as it used to be called, USB three goes five gigabits per second, maximum throughput, not guaranteed like all the time, but maximum throughput, depending on the devices. Whereas USB 3.1 Gen two goes 10 gigabits a second. That's what they say. That's it. There you go. Done. Thank you for that, Phil. Good stuff. Yeah, good. We can move on now. Past that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, listener Jason, we've been talking about USB-C. Now that's different than USB-3 because, as we know, letters define the shape of the connector. Numbers define the speed and capabilities of the transmission. <sighs> Anyway, Jason says, uh, after listening to Mac Geekab 740, and you were talking, 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 talking about trying to find uh, USB-C and uh, Thunderbolt 3 docks and hubs. He says, I'm part of the Mac admins community and a fellow admin has created an amazing spreadsheet and blog post going over exactly this. And sure enough, Jason has found a stellar list of some of these things here and a Google Doc to go along with it. That uh, that really kind of lists through all of these, not all, but most of these devices and uh, and how they all work and all of that stuff, the different capabilities. They've got pricing in there, but of course, pricing changes pretty, pretty rapidly. But you, you, it tells you how many USB-C ports, how many, um, you know, if is there Ethernet? Does it have display port? Does it have mini display port? So we'll put this list um We'll put this list in the show notes, of course, because it's super handy to have uh, to have and be able to look this stuff up, especially as lots and lots more devices are coming out that are supporting all this stuff. Right, John? I got one. What do you have? One, one USB-C port is, is what I mean. <laughs> you have one on what? Well, on a, a charger. Hmm. Okay, got it. Yeah, right, right, right. Which charger is that? Uh, Ventev. Okay. That, that combined with a USB-C to lightning cable from Apple will let you fast charge uh, their latest phones. Got it's it. It's the fastest charging you can do. Yeah, I was like, uh, what am I going to do with this? I don't have anything that has USB-C. And it's like, well, now I do. Uh, uh. Interesting. All right. Well, you I mean, for I, the future, I can use it to charge all sorts of other things. But, um, sure. That sure. Time will come. That time will come. Well, that time has come for me, John, 
because as listeners know, uh, I Lucas and my son and I got new MacBook Airs for Christmas. And so I am now in the USB-C world here. What listeners don't know, because I, but you did, John, is that I did, I didn't share because I wanted it to be a surprise is my wife now uh, has a new Mac mini for, uh, for her desk at, uh, at the house, which has USB-C, but also has USB-A ports and an ethernet port and an HDMI port. So it's really well, well configured. It's got four. Well, they're, they're USB-C ports that support Thunderbolt three, just like the two USB-C ports on the MacBook airs uh, also support Thunderbolt three. So very versatile in that regard. And I have to say, I'm going to go through some of the things that I've tested with it here, but I have to say, I am, I, I'm really thrilled about this whole USB-C thing. Like the, the dongle thing, I actually kind of like it because it really gives you flexibility on what you have, especially after living with an air where most of the stuff that I did was off of its Thunderbolt two port or Thunderbolt one port, maybe uh, because, you know, I wanted gigabit ethernet, which that didn't have. I wanted USB three, which that device didn't have when it was built, but Thunderbolt let you expand. And so, or let me expand. And so there you go. So I've messed with quite a few of these things over the last couple of weeks as I've been testing these airs and all of that stuff. The, um, there are a couple of favorites that have have shown up for me. Um, IO Gear makes a USB C travel dock that has power delivery. So there's there's a couple of features that uh, you know, and this is why this chart that Jason found is great because it it allows you to narrow down on what you need. Uh, a lot of these things, you know, will give you ports. But will they let you power the device through it, or do you have to, if you want to charge, say, your MacBook or your MacBook Air, do you have to plug that the charger into a separate port, or can you plug it into a port on the dock? So being able to pass power, aka power delivery, is an important thing. Uh, and this US, this one from IO Gear does that. It also has a cleverly uh, included Ethernet port in it, so you get Ethernet on this, which I find handy to travel with something that can let me plug into ethernet. It's rare that I do that in a hotel nowadays, but it has happened. And when you're on the road and it's midnight, it's nice to already have this device with you. So, um, so that's one of the reasons I like this IO gear thing. It's very handy in that regard. Um, and it's, it's 69 bucks. It's got power delivery and ethernet. Kingston also has a pretty cool little hub. It does not have Ethernet, but it does have HDMI and uh, a couple of USB-A ports. The, the IO Gear one also has USB-A ports on it. That's sort of a given. You need some USB-A ports. And it does support power delivery, so you can uh, go through it, and that's 50 bucks. And one that I really like um, but does not have power delivery is the very sleek and cleverly designed Anchor USB-C hub. It's got three... USB-A ports along the side, uh, an HDMI port along the side, and an Ethernet port in the end. And the thing is like barely wider. I mean, it's essentially as wide as it would need to be to have an Ethernet port on it. That's it. It's really sleek and slim. This will be the thing that lives in my laptop case uh, just because of how compact it is. But it doesn't pass power delivery. Now, obviously, I have two ports on the MacBook Air, so I can charge with one. But having power delivery is nice, right? So, uh, so there you go. And then, uh, another one that, that, um, kind of comes in here is Kensington makes what they call a USB C travel dock. It's larger, but for 76 bucks, it's got pass through USB charging, ethernet, uh, HDMI VGA, which is, can be handy. Uh, you know, if you're trying to connect to an old projector or whatever, and, um, and three USB A ports. So that's uh, that. As far as the USB C stuff goes, those are the things that I've that I sort of narrowed down on. I've, I tested a bunch of others, but frankly, some of them were crap. I will point out, even though uh, the device was crap, so I won't talk about which one it was. But the MacBook Air's USB C ports are spaced exactly the same as the two on the side of the MacBook Pro which means that those docks that plug into both ports simultaneously will work with the MacBook Air. No problem. Even stuff that was built prior to the Air being announced and released, they they I've I tried a few of them, few of them, they plug in no problem. 
I, I'm a little leery of those because it gives you a real good lever to break those things off with um, if you've got something sort of, you know, plugged right in there. But um, but they will work. So just so you know, thoughts on that before I jump uh, into Thunderbolt, John. Nope, I'll probably need one of them someday. Yeah. Yeah. So Thunderbolt docks um, are, you know, I, they are a thing. And if you have a Thunderbolt equipped Mac, you probably at least consider getting a dock in the past if you if you don't already have one. Super handy being able to add lots and lots of ports. Of course, Thunderbolt, uh, if you if it's a powered Thunderbolt dock, a Thunderbolt 3 dock, it will also power your, you know, it'll charge your laptop so it can act as a desk-based charging station so you don't need to buy another charging brick like that's all included um and the two that i've looked at there are the owc one for 299 and the kensington one for 199 they both pass uh 85 watts of power our macbook airs uh, only the charger that comes with them is 30 so this is more than enough and they have different configurations of ports uh the owc one has um I don't, it has, it, it cleverly has a mini display port on it, which is handy because it sort of fits all those other things. It's got five, I think, USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports and Ethernet and, um, and then a couple of, you know, uh, uh, USB C ports to, you know, to plug pass through and audio and all that good stuff. And then the Kensington one has a display port port on it, like a larger display port, which can also be handy. Uh, as well as, uh, you know, a bunch of USB C ports and Ethernet and all that good stuff. Or, yeah, sorry, USB A ports and Ethernet and all that stuff. So it's worth checking those out. Those are both powered, those have 80, 85 watts. IO Gear has a little clever Thunderbolt 3 travel dock. Um, it, I'm not, I'm not sure where this fits into the mix. It, it, it's cleverly designed. It contains its own little cable. It doesn't pass power because it has no way of taking power in. It's got DisplayPort, HDMI, USB-A, and Ethernet. One of each. That's it. So it kind of gives you, you know, everything you might need in a hotel room, I suppose. But you might want another USB-A port, and it doesn't have that. So, And it's 136 bucks. So I'm not sure where this fits in the realm, but it, it's, it's so cleverly designed, I didn't want to ignore it. So... That's what I got on those, John. Thoughts on anything else? I got some chargers to talk about too, especially must be one that I'm very excited about. But but while we're on the Thunderbolt thing, I figured I'd. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Anything? No. No. Okay. Well, while we're on the Thunderbolt thing, I'm going to take a detour here and go to our third sponsor, which is OWC. And OWC makes all kinds of great thunderbolt things including their new thunderbolt 3 10g ethernet adapter right it allows anybody with a thunderbolt 3 equipped mac or pc to download stuff 10 times faster than gigabit ethernet plugs right into one of your thunderbolt 3 ports it's got uh it's actually got a great little design it's got the ethernet port at the end of course it will also support gigabit ethernet so this could be the device that you take with you and you know that you're always going to get the fastest that you can and this you know like this epitomizes the benefits of thunderbolt because here you have a mac that either didn't couldn't come with thunderbolt with a gigabit ethernet or in the case of like the mac mini that i got for lisa chose not to order it with uh 10 gig ethernet but sure enough, I can add it. That's what Thunderbolt lets you do is it lets you expand the capabilities and OWC is right on the forefront of all this stuff. So you really, you got to check this out. So go to MacSales.com and, uh, and you know, that's where you can find this. We'll also put a link to it in the show notes here, of course, because that's what we do. But while you're there, you can check out their Thunderbolt three doc that we just talked about. And, when it's time for a RAM upgrade or you need an external hard drive or a case for a hard drive that you've got, OWC is where John and I go. We just visit MaxSales.com. And that's really, it truly is the first place that, that I shop for any of this stuff because they understand what they're doing. They know what they're doing. They understand their products and they care deeply about making sure that you get the right solution for you. They really, they, you know, there's a reason they've been in business. Uh, long, well, let me put it this way. Uh, on Friday. Yeah. 
Friday the 28th, Mac Observer, we celebrated our 20th anniversary. OWC has been in business, I will say, far longer than we have. They really do know what they're doing. There's a reason that they've been around this long. You got to check them out. MacSales.com and our thanks to OWC at MacSales.com, Otherworld Computing, for sponsoring this episode. All right. I promised chargers, John. And one in particular that I am thrilled about is the Anchor PowerCore Speed 20,000 PD. Now that sounds all fine and good. What is it? Well, it costs a hundred bucks. Okay. What is it? It is two things. It is a wall charger and a battery pack. The battery pack has both of these devices. In fact, can output up to 30 Watts, which means you can use the wall charger to power your MacBook air and you can use the battery to power your MacBook air. Real simple, just USB cable, USB-C cable, and boom, you're good to go. Very cool that we can easily power our laptops with batteries now. And of course, those of you that have had USB-C laptops for a while already understand this beauty. And if you didn't already understand this beauty, well, now you do. It's a really, really beautiful thing. So, so thoughts on that, John? Uh-oh. Did I yeah, I like John? the PD okay. thing. Yeah. No, no, I'm following along. Yeah. Yeah. The thing I mentioned had that too. That's uh, what allows fast charge with a lot of things. Right. Right. Yeah. The whole idea of sending more than five Watts or more than 10 Watts, I guess, over USB is, is sort of what falls into that PD or power delivery range. And I think power delivery by definition goes over a USB C port. Right. But, um, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm stoked about this, especially for for CES. I'm I'm curious to see how much I'll use this battery to uh, to power my laptop. I, I mean, you know, I get easily getting eight hours of battery life out of this thing, so I don't know that I'll even need it. But um, but you know, it's much better than the old days when we had to jury rig like a battery and splice a MagSafe connector together and do all that stuff. I like I like our new our new our new world here, John. It's good. Yeah, those were dark days. Those were dark days. Yeah, I agree. Well, when they were making everything proprietary, I mean, they still do it here yeah. and there, but yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's good. I love I like the power power delivery stuff. It's fun. Makes life uh, makes life more fun. So it's good. Any uh, any other thoughts on that before we before we move on to whatever's next here? Uh, whatever. All right. Whatever. What? <laughs> whatever. Uh, all right. Greg has a question. I don't know that we're going to have a good answer for this, to be perfectly honest, Mr. Braun. Uh, but <coughs> Greg says, I'm looking to change my Apple ID, but I can't quite figure out how to do it. And I don't want to destroy any of my data. I think we're going to make this one a geek challenge, but maybe we have an answer for him, John. And so I figured I'd ask your advice. He says, here's my situation. And this is the details are important. Uh, he says, years ago, I created a mobile me account and I still have access to that Apple ID and its email. Uh, with the advent of iCloud a little while after that, I created a separate Apple ID, not using an iCloud email address, but using my work email address. That's the Apple ID I've been using as my primary iCloud account for logging into devices, handling app store purchases, iCloud photo library, et cetera. So that's the main one. He says, I'd like to change my Apple ID from my work account to an at iCloud.com email address to simplify things. He says, I found a support article from Apple, which is informative, but doesn't give me quite the info that I need. And this article is titled, oh, come on, Safari, do your job. Uh, the article is titled, if you forgot your Apple ID and you can go through and change some things, uh, I'm not sure why that would be the one that he found, but okay. He says in particular, I don't know how to add, how to add an iCloud.com email address as one of my reachable at addresses. It won't let me add my old mobile me address, presumably because it's an active Apple ID. I thought that maybe I could just create a new iCloud.com email address when trying to add new reachable ad addresses, but that doesn't work. After entering several addresses that were rejected as unusable, I found one that was only I found one that was 
but only to be told that a verification code was sent to that address. Not what I was hoping to see. Uh, He says, I know there's no way to combine Apple IDs and man, I wish there were, you know what? I'm with you on this, Greg. Uh, But is there a way to downgrade an account so that it's not a fully fledged Apple ID, but just an email address? If so, then that's probably my simplest path forward here. So, yeah. um, All right. I I don't uh, want to help the discussion here. Okay. You go all the way to the bottom of that article. So I was wondering that, too. But now I think you go all the way to the bottom. See that thing that says change your Apple ID. I do. I think that's what he wants because yep. that goes into some of the details that he brought up here. Yeah. There's it, another article about changing Apple IDs. Yeah. And so if you click on that, that makes it because he, he says that's what he wants to do. And the thing is the article itself has two classifications. It's like, does your Apple ID end with this, this or this, or is it not a Apple? Right. Suffix. And depending on what state you're in, you may be able to go, in one direction they, they outline all this in the article and they tell you how to do this so you got to log everybody out and stuff but um if the goal is to get away from the work address which you know oops <laughs> uh, yeah this seems to uh, allow that you can go in that direction you can't go in the other direction i think that's that's the summary here yeah so, so i don't know why he was getting some that weren't permitted unless someone else already had them i don't know Oh, yeah. But I mean, he said he found one and maybe that was it. Maybe the one he thought that he found um, there's that whole reachable at thing and you can add an Apple like an iCloud dot com address to that section, at least according to Apple, uh, even if your main account is not an iCloud dot com address it says uh Mm -hmm. if your apple id is a third party email address you can enter an icloud me or mac.com email address that's already associated with your account and to see these you go to apple id.apple.com and check the reachable at section in the account section so i i think i think what he wants to do is possible however i don't know that you can do what he wants and downgrade this other one that's the real question is can you take can you take an apple uh, like an icloud address or a me.com address or a mac.com address and after the fact merge that in and and i think the answer there is no i i think but um but that would be worth calling apple support or you know using the apple support app and just asking about before you punt on that and find a different address but i think if you find a different address you can You can do this. I've been able to add addresses to my uh, to my account before, and and that seems to work fine. And then they stay as like sub addresses and you can promote them out. But I think once you've promoted them out, then and and once they stand on their own as fully fledged, I don't think you can downgrade it. But if there's a way, I think Apple supports the way to do that. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. And yes, I, I, again, I will say I truly agree with you and wish that Apple would, uh, would, would let you merge Apple IDs. Uh, I mean, I, I grok that that probably creates major headaches on the back end for them. So maybe that's not the, uh, maybe that's not the right way to go, but still, you know, it would be, it would be helpful for us as users. So any more thoughts, John? nope nope all right then let's go to david and david says someone donated an old ipad a1337 to a charity my wife works at and she brought it home for me to troubleshoot and i can't seem to get past one thing it won't boot he says it's odd when plugged into any of my usb hubs or mac mini the screen will have a little black black background flicker and nothing else. If I use one of my iPhone plugs and plug it into the wall, though, I can get it to boot to a connect to iTunes prompt holding sleep and home. However, when I unplug it and to plug it into the computer, it immediately shuts off. Is the battery just completely toast and this thing is bricked or do you have any other troubleshooting or suggestions? So it sure sounds like the battery is the issue here. Um, and I, you know, I'm wondering if you could find a USB hub or like a Thunderbolt dock. Like I know my, my uh, Thunderbolt two dock 
that I have on the iMac downstairs from OWC has obviously a bunch of USB A ports on it. One or two, the two on the side are high speed ports, but they're also sync ports, right? So you can use them, say, to power an external hard drive or fast charge your iPhone or iPad or whatever. I wonder if that's what this needs. It needs enough power to actually run the thing because the battery is dead. So plugging into a port like that, that also then syncs with the computer and then doing the, you know, the thing where you, you hold down the sleep and home would allow you to have the computer see this. I think you need a higher powered USB port than your computer or existing docks um, or hubs provide. And, and I, I think that, but the core issue is that the battery shot. I, I, I would agree with that. And so maybe you just want to do a battery replacement on it. And, and then, you know, and then it sounds like you, you might have a further option down the road. I don't know. That's, that's my thought. What do you think, John? Uh, you could run a tool like coconut battery, which uh, requires you to connect by a right. USB right. to right. your iDevice and it'll show you the battery level and it's probably like zero or something. Uh, yeah, I think that's the problem. It won't even see it, right? Because it's not powering up to announce itself. Like he needs more power. But I agree with you. Yeah, coconut battery would be the way to do it. Yeah. Would a well, no. The the steps, the, the holding down those two buttons is like doing a restore or something. It isn't puts it? it into yeah. It puts it into. I don't know if we call that DFU mode, but we put it into restore mode. I think that DFU mode is right. one step past that. But yep, yep. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. All right. Any other thoughts before we uh, before we move on here, John? No. Nope. All right. Gary writes, he says, my late 2015 iMac has been having moments where the machine will momentarily freeze with the beach ball, hiccup on iTunes, and doing other random tasks. The problem is particularly no noticeable when I'm watching a YouTube video. Uh, and if it's a longer one, like part of a video game walkthrough. The video will freeze, but the audio will continue, and eventually the video will speed up to the current point and resume. On iTunes, the song I'm listening to will momentarily stop and then resume, and sometimes even deleting an email will cause a hiccup. Given the machine's age, I'm thinking the internal hard drive is showing warning signs of its impending demise. My Apple Care runs out at the end of the year, and as we all know, Apple Care is a one-time deal, and you cannot renew it. He says, I know uh, it's the machine because I don't have these issues on my phone or other laptop on the same network. So I've seen videos on how to change the drive on YouTube, but it looks pretty tough for my comfort level. Uh, he says, I do a nuke and pave each time Apple releases a new version of Mac OS. So I just wiped this back in September when Mojave was released. So I don't think it's a software issue. Uh, he says, I use Google Chrome as my default browser. Um, the OS and programs are all up to date and I have uh, security software running. So, yeah, I, I would tend to agree with you. I mean, you could boot in safe mode and see if this happens to kind of skip any potential, you know, CPU type things. I mean, and that's actually one thing I would check is launch activity monitor. Or if you're running something like iStat menus, is the CPU pegged at these times when it's lagging. If it is, then that's something to look at. Right. You know, and, uh, but if it's not, and especially if it's happening in safe mode where you're not running whatever security software might be there, cause that too is sort of built to get in the way, uh, or just disable your security software temporarily to, to test this barring that. Yeah. I think it might very well be the drive. Um, it's possible. You know, it, it's it's hard to say for sure, especially, you know, troubleshooting from a distance via email. But um, but, I, you know, if you've got Apple Care that runs out before the end of the year, get a case opened with Apple Care right away. Uh, even if you're going to do some more troubleshooting on your own, get a case open with Apple Care right away, because I think once you've got the case opened uh, and reported the issue, even if like they don't have an appointment for you right away or whatever, You'll still get the benefit of it being covered under Apple Care, you know, if the case opened before it expired. Uh, so, yeah, that that would that would be 
that would be the thing. I I'm not convinced that it's the drive. It it this does sound like a CPU or even GPU thing. Although the iTunes thing, uh, iTunes thing sort of mitigates that that or negates that. That's not that's not the GPU. But it it could well be the CPU getting bogged down. Uh, it could be your security software, or it could be the hard drive. But I'd open an Apple Care case before your Apple Care uh, winds up. So, yeah. Thoughts on this, John? Yeah, I could see a dying hard drive as affecting performance because you're going to be, you may be swapping sure. from that drive. And if the drive is starting to fail, that's going to take longer than necessary, causing pauses, right? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've certainly seen, you know, what he talks about with with iTunes lagging and email, you know, deleting an email, causing a lag like that. <coughs> That definitely could point to the hard drive, you know, especially once we sort of disable whatever security software it is just to get that out of the way, because we don't know what that is. And it could that could very well be it. But um, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was the hard drive. Uh, But, you know, it could be something else, too. There's there's other things to look at. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Any more thoughts on that, John? Moving right along. All right. Uh, are you ready to do Jim here, John? We've got a little time to do that. Yeah. Want to do yeah, Jim? You want me to do Jim. Kevin? Okay, let's do Jim. Let's do it. All right. So Jim asks, do you know the utility for auditing a system security certificates on a Mac, comparing them to the current Apple default certificates? Then he wrote a letter with a little more detail, and I don't think I'm going to read the whole thing here, but I'm going to try to get to the uh, gist of it. Um, all right. So as we all know, security uh, uh, certificates help secure and uh, verify someone's identity. Um, and you have some on your machine. Uh, if you run keychain access and then go to system roots, it's going to list uh, the, uh, the certificates that are trusted and uh, they're given to Apple and they, they will update that when they, they see fit. Um, so he found an article um, which one is it here? Yeah. So which certificates trust by Apple? So there's a sport article that shows that. Okay. And it's like, okay, well that's interesting. And it lists them all out. And, um, but then it also gives, um, instructions on how to look at, at least on the Mac, what they call the trust store. Um, and there's actually a file, I guess we'll uh, paste that path in here, where if you look at this file, so it's an HTML file, so it'll open up in your browser. But if you find this file and click on it, it'll show you the same thing. But what it also shows you um, is the Trust Store version. Um, and I think the current one is 20180718800. Uh-huh. Then he said, okay, and by the way, I noticed the discrepancy between the stuff in the article and the stuff that I see in the trust store file on my computer. And he identified certain certificates and um, I verified that they were in fact installed on my system. So I don't think there's anything to worry about. Here's what he found is basically <laughs> um, Apple hasn't updated that article. Aha. So that's why he's seeing a difference. And and I figured what they did is so between, uh, because the article says this is for um Mac OS 10.14, not 10.14.2. So it looks like they haven't gotten around updating that article yet. Um, so that I think he's sense. okay. Okay. Then he identified another certificate um, that also wasn't listed there. And I'm like, okay, fair enough. And it's a, actually an Apple developer certificate. And I think it may not be listed in the trust store because it's not a root certificate. It's an, it's an intermediate certificate. But... um. Now, back to the question of, is there a utility where you can audit your keychain? And I would say the best utility is probably keychain access. Yeah, um, it's a manual audit, right? There's no way to say, make sure well, I have the defaults, right? Well, what you can do, so you can click on system routes. You can click on a certificate. You then go to the keychain access menu. There's then a certificate assistant menu. And then there's an evaluate whatever certificate you just uh Got. And then that brings up a dialogue and it's like, what do you want to do? You want to, you know, check out an SSL, SMIME, or just, you know, general. And if you say that, it'll then show you the trust tree and it'll, it'll show you the same thing that you see for the most part in the, uh, 
um, what you see in keychain access list, but it gives you a little more information. It's like, oh, by the way, this certificate is also here. And, you know, here's the one authorized. So you, like, for example, the uh, intermediate uh, developer one, if you put it through this certificate assistant, it'll say, oh, by the way, I'm signed by the main Apple developer certificate. So it's like, okay, that's good. Huh. So you're not, the thing is, you're going to see if, if you basically with keychain access, if you see something and it has a red X as the status, there's something wrong with it. It's either expired, it may have been revoked. Um, um, those are the two really only good reasons, or somebody just screwed up the configuration of it. Sure. I think what this tool also does, so there are some protocols, uh, OCSP or CRL, um, that I believe this enhanced um, certificate assistant actually does reach out over a network to, uh, to check with the server to say, hey, is this really yeah. good? Um, oddly enough, the latest version, Dave, doesn't seem to have any, that they took away the, with the ability to configure these protocols. Remember that you used to have an option. You could say like, yeah, yeah maybe yeah. use this if you can, or always use this or never use this. That's gone now. So they've changed that. So I, I'm assuming they just baked the functionality in where it'll try to reach out over the network. The, the, and I'm like, you know, I don't think there's anything to worry about. And then got another response saying, well, you know, there was somebody that pulled this fast one a while ago. It was a vendor that released the P I think it was a headphone software or something. Um, and the problem is they had a self-signed certificate, um, that they had you install, I guess, to then do, you know, interact with their software. That's a really bad idea. <laughs> and what happened is that it was kind of an exploit because I guess the thing is they, they didn't encode it properly. So you could read the private key. And so, so it's possible to, for somebody to try to pull a fast one by doing something like that. So that was just a poor implementation uh, of certificates, but it, even if that did come up, but the Mac, should ask you, especially if something is like, oh, well, wait, this is a self-signed certificate. Are you sure you want to trust this? I think right. the Mac will usually flag that. Um, at least like with the, the so for example, I, I have a self-signed uh, Synology certificate. And I think the first time you encounter the site, the Mac will say, hey, uh, this is self-signed. And it's like, do you want to trust it? And I'm like, yeah, because, you know, I just generated it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah. If you know, you know. Yep. Yeah. So you should always get a warning with self-signed certificates, which basically mean that they, yeah, you, you say, hey, I'm okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> Is what a self-signed certificate, whereas a signed certificate by a CA means, well, I say he's okay too. And it's like, oh, all right. Well, that's fine. Right. Yeah. So I, I did some digging on this too, and I found a Reddit. Uh, no, it wasn't Reddit. It was a Stack Exchange thing that goes all the way back to snow leopard where someone was essentially asking, how do I restore the default certificate settings? Right? Because that would be a way to say, yep, look, I just want to wipe the slate. I want to make sure I have what Mac OS wants me to have and nothing else. And, and let's go. And there's no, uh, there's no way to like open keychain access and say, go right. But if you were to wipe a drive and install a fresh copy of Mojave and update it to, you know, all the latest and greatest, whatever, let software update do its thing, then you would have a default set of certificates. And those would be the dot keychain files in system library keychains. And you could take those and then replace them uh, in or put them in place of the ones that you have on your existing system. I don't have to say, I, but I'll say it anyway, that I highly recommend you back up uh, your systems before messing around with this stuff. But that should work, especially if you're just taking the two dot keychain files, or I think it's three now, but moving those and wiping out anything, you know, any other dot keychain files that are there, then reboot because you're changing some core level stuff. It's always better to reboot when you do that. That should get you there. Like that. In fact, I can't imagine why it wouldn't. You'd still have any of your user certificates that you install because those are stored in your user's keychain, not your system keychain. But this would wipe out any of that stuff and uh, and get you the default things for for your Mac. Mm -hmm. So, so that would be one way to do it. That'd be one way. 
that's that's, that's what something I, got. I would spend my time on but <laughs> fair fair okay yeah 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 no problem yep now there is a, a, a bit as a parting word so um yeah i'll have to see if i can find that article which uh about that exploit yep but um now there is something called certificate transparency that is kind of making the rounds. And I think it's an attempt. I think Google is leading it, or at least I thought they hosted a page talking right. about it. Right. But... Yeah. You've mentioned this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think you mentioned it to me. You're like, I heard about it. I think you heard about it at Pac Tech, right? But, oh, um, maybe, yeah, that could have been. Yeah, you're right. And you were like, hey, you should know about this. I'm like, okay. So I looked and it's basically an effort to open up the standards. So there's more touch points so that if a certificate gets compromised, someone will know about it. Um, sooner rather than later i think Got that's it. basically this is accomplishing yep yep makes sense makes sense because right now the way the system is set up if somebody manages to forge a certificate saying it was signed by you but it really wasn't um there's no way for the current infrastructure to let you know that whereas i think this is an effort to tell you hey you know this certificate was issued under your uh, name or did, did you know about this uh, sounds like a great idea I that is a great idea huh yeah, of course. It also, you know, I mentioned when I mentioned uh, OCSP and CRL, which are the, the network messaging ways that you can check for certificates that have been revoked. Um, I've always had a lot of people say, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, 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 it's hard to deploy that properly. Um, so I guess this is an effort. Certificate transparency is an effort to kind of fix that. Yeah. Fair. Well, that's good. Well, that's good. Coolio. All right. Well, that's uh, I think that's going to do it for us today, my friend. It's been wow. uh, I know it's it's been it's been great. Like lots of information in in this show. I I learned way more than my five things. Um, mm. uh, it's good. It's great. And it's I've learned I can't even count the number of things that I've learned all year doing this this show. So thank you to all of you that listen, all of you premium supporters that support, all of you that send in questions, all of you that send in tips, and of course everything else and interact, and of course those of you that visit the forums at MacGeekup.com slash forums. It really like I, I'm sure I've said this every year, but you know, it's like, oh, I, I just love where this community is and, and where we all are together. So I uh, couldn't be happier. Actually, I could. Uh, let's make the community bigger. Tell everybody you know. Really, seriously. Like, that's the that's the thing. Just just spread the word about Mac Geek Gab. And uh, the easiest way to do that is to tell people to visit MacGeekGab.com so that they can get their questions answered. You know, that's that's usually a good entry point. Like, hey, if you got a problem, ask those guys. They might actually answer it, you know, for free and talk about it on the show. That's pretty good these days. So that's what we do. That's what we do. Uh, yeah. 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 All right. Uh, what else do we have here, John? Uh, we talked about the email addresses. You premium folks, you know that you can email premium at MacGeekGab.com. And if you want to learn more about that, MacGeekGab.com slash premium. Talked about the forums. I want to thank, uh, I'll say thanks to you, John, for yet another year of doing all this. I'm looking forward to CES. Next week, I think our next episode will be recorded at CES, unless we foobar something, uh, which, of course, is possible, because not only will we be recording from the road, but we'll be recording on a new setup, because I'll have that air with me, although I don't I don't foresee any issues. If I do have an issue, I know who to call, except it's us, so there you go. Actually, I know some other people to call. There's, we, we all have our support systems, and that's how it goes. Uh, thanks to Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Thanks to all of our sponsors, of course, Atlassian with Ops Genie, as we mentioned earlier in the show. Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com, LinkedIn Jobs at LinkedIn.com slash MGG, Smile at SmileSoftware.com slash podcast, Eero at Eero.com slash MGG couple others coming up too it's good stuff that's what i got happy new year everybody have a good one make sure you have fun make sure you're kind to everyone around you answer a question share the show 
John, any words from you as we uh, as we make our departure and say goodbye to 2018 and say hello to 2019? I would say you all made it. Congratulations. It's the end of, end of 2018. And I'm pretty sure none of you got caught. Don't get 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 caught. Made up.